I gotta talk to you guys about one of the next projects that I think I need to do. And this is something that's been weighing on my heart for a little while, especially because I am a beekeeper. A lot of people, you know, they say like, oh, I'd like to be a beekeeper, but I'm allergic to bees, or I wanna bring, bring in pollinators, I'm just not sure if having beehives is the right thing for me. So that has led me on a mission to open up another opportunity for individuals who may want to bring in the pollinators, but not necessarily keep the bees like I do, which is fine. There's a lot of things that you can do. And one of my next projects that I'm gonna be doing actually involves this old hay feeder. Okay. All right. First, let me make sure I don't have any wasp nests up top because that would not be good to catch that on video. Um, I have a hay feeder that we purchased from a local... Seriously, I have to look for spiders too. <laughs> I have a hay feeder that we purchased for our goats. Now, I share that my goats and my cows are actually together. Um, there's a reason why. A lot of it is parasite control, and then also, like, the goats really do help clean up the fence line. There are some downfalls to having that. I'm gonna prop this camera up right here because my arm's getting tired. There are some downfalls of having multi-species livestock living in the same pastures that you rotate. And we have learned that now. One of them is when you have cows and goats together, especially when it comes to feeding, it can get a little bit interesting. My cows have learned that when I go to bring my goats treats that um, I think they think that they're just really big goats as well. So they would just basically trample over and try to get the, they're bullies, you know, they're pasture, the, those pasture puppies are bullies. But what I have also learned is any type of feeder that we have, we have to make it large enough and, and beefy enough to be able to withstand those, the cows. This cute little feeder really is not ideal. I feed our goats inside the stalls. That helps cut down the competition between the food. Uh, but when it comes to hay feeders, this is like a fun toy that the cows can literally push around. And 95, 99% of the time, I am having to go back in there, pick it up, and they're just destroying it. So we pulled it out of our pastures and it has been sitting up here for the last year. But that has led me to start wanting to talk about what our next uh, project is and, and how can I help, as a beekeeper, how can I help encourage other people to bring in the pollinators and uh, give, give our pollinators, our, our native pollinators, a home. So this goat feeder, I'm actually going to turn into a mason bee habitat. And I wanna take it and I wanna put it up by our apothecary so we can go up and see if we're giving our mason bees a special little habitat. And I figure since it's the beekeeper's apothecary, it'd be just another, another good home, a good opportunity to bring in the pollinators.
Mason bees are a huge asset to, to farms as well. And there are a lot of things that you can actually do. We're gonna start by building that hay feeder into its own habitat so that we can welcome them in and give them a safe place that if they want to come and make that their home, then that is what we will do. I wanna add a couple of fascinating facts about mason bees. And really, it's not to discourage you from being a honeybee beekeeper, but it's more to encourage you that, hey, you know, this is another way of, of being a beekeeper. At the Homesteaders of America conference, I was able to talk to the kidsteaders and we made a little simple mason bee habitat out of uh, rolled up thick paper. I would have used metal cans, uh, but we didn't get that. So I did encourage each kid when they go home to take all those tubes out and put it in a metal can and teach them that they can now be beekeepers as well. Mr. Gray, what are you doing? How come you're up at the apothecary with me? Say, say hi, Mr. Gray. He decided to come up for a walk with me and uh, wanted to come up and join the apothecary. So much like the log pile behind me, we're actually going to construct this mason bee habitat with some of our round logs. I'm gonna drill some holes through it. And then I do want it up here by the apothecary. I'm excited to have something up here that could be used as a teaching opportunity as well. I think we might have to take this inside the apothecary because <laughs> he is trying to cut grass and I feel like I'm constantly just turning off my camera. So it is okay. We're gonna sneak inside the apothecary. Come on, Mr. Gray. Come on, Mr. Gray. Hi. Come on. <laughs> Oh, you guys are getting a sneak peek of the apothecary. It's not done yet. So it's getting there though. Um, the cabinets are, all the upper cabinets are starting to go up. Uh, these are glass and then we'll work on the bottom ones. Um, that's a little bit better and hopefully a little bit quieter. So I started doing a little bit of research about mason bees and why they're called mason bees. I do think that we need to give those little solitary bees a little more credit than what we, what we think. Honeybees are very important, but I 100% believe that our native bees are extremely valued and very important to our environment. I was reading some pretty interesting facts about mason bees and why they're called mason bees. And essentially a female bee will go in, she'll find a, a nice long tube, which would be essentially her, her nest, and she'll go in and she'll pack it with a bunch of pollen and she'll lay an egg and then she actually takes mud and she will make a mud cell wall. And then she'll do it again. Pollen, an egg, mud cell wall. And again, and again, and again. And so this long tube is now filled with individual little eggs and their own food pantry of pollen. And then that egg will hatch and they will then go out and repeat the cycle. It takes one mason bee to do the equivalent work of a hundred honeybees when it comes to pollination. Now mason bees don't make honey. They're more docile than honeybees and their venom, which female bees are the only ones that sting, is said to be less painful than a honeybee sting. But this is just the start of it and I can't wait to take you guys along that journey with me. And if you have children, I think that this is a great project to do with your children and actually pass on some knowledge and some nurturing and caring and, and teach them that they, that they are now beekeepers. I hope you stick with me on this journey of becoming a mason bee beekeeper. And I'd love to see or hear what others do for other types of pollinators, not just honeybees, not just mason bees. What do you guys do to help bring on the pollinators? And who knows, maybe we'll incorporate some of your guys' practices here on our, on our farm. Thank you guys for watching. And as always, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty and learn something old.